So as Karen mentioned earlier, um, this convening's organizing principle comes from several key moments in letter number seven. Um, and we're calling it order and disintegration. And I think we kind of laugh, laugh, left the last group conversation at a perfectly appropriate place to really look at what happens when things break down or what happens to structures when we undo them. And so Camila Janan Rashid, uh, who is an artist and a pedagogue and a brilliant human, <laughs> um, We'll, we'll talk about um, existing structures, systems, rules, their logics, and how we might interrupt or subvert them. And then to my right, writer and art historian Aruna D'Souza and artist Chloe Bass will respond, and I, will respond to Camila's thoughts and we'll talk. Um, and while you'll, have, while you'll find extensive uh, bios on all of the participants in today's convening in the program, Chloe's was inadvertently omitted. So I'm just gonna say a few things about Chloe. <laughs> so you know who she is. Um, Chloe is a multi-form conceptual artist working in performance, situation, conversation, publication, and installation. Her work uses daily life as a site of deep research to address scales of intimacy, where patterns hold and break as group sizes expand. Chloe's projects have appeared nationally and internationally, including Wayfinding, her upcoming solo show at the Studio Museum in Harlem, which opens next Saturday. The opening's from 12 to 4, so check it out. I'll be there. And recent exhibitions, she's also had recent exhibitions at the Knockdown Center, the Kitchen, the Brooklyn Museum, Q Art Foundation, Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts Project Space, the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art, the James Gallery, and elsewhere. Her monograph, The Book of Everyday Instruction, was published by the Operating System in December 2018, and she is an assistant professor of art at Queens College at CUNY. And with that, Camila, take it away. Alrighty. Um, before we start, can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn to a person next to you and say hello and ask them how their day is. Just say hi. Hi, hey, We're going to come back together in like 15 <laughs> seconds. Yeah, you're about to get better. It's going to get good. Take another 10 seconds. Take another five. Hopefully, we make a friend. Another four, three, I can use my teach voice, two, <laughs> and one. All righty, we're gonna come back together. I shouldn't have asked them to talk to each other because this is never gonna now end. Now look what you did, Camila. Yes. Nice to meet other people. <laughs> all righty. You guys can all go out for drinks with each other afterwards, but we're gonna start now. Um, so as I was already introduced, I'm Camila. I'm gonna be introducing some ideas and then we're just gonna actually chat um, because like, we all know each other through different contexts and it'll just be fun to chat with all of you. Um, so there's a moment of irony for me because this is a sort of a section around order and I spent a bunch of time trying to order my thoughts uh, around a lot of this stuff. And so even though we talk about disintegration and trying to resist in order, we still often fall into sort of the patterns uh, and sort of this sort of necessity to create coherency with everything that we do. Um, so in my attempt, I'm going to try to not follow that logic and sort of go through some thoughts that I've been having around um, order, which makes me think a lot about leakage, which makes me think a lot about containers or things that contain or hold, which makes me think a lot about holding. Um, so yeah, um, so I guess one thing that's worth mentioning is that this morning I was up at Studio Museum doing a workshop, um, and for the past couple of months I've been doing these workshops, which I think are about creating leaky sentences or sentences that just don't sort of hold themselves together or sort of like spill out. Um, they don't really involve punctuation. They involve people co-producing a sentence together. They involve sort of chance operations. Uh, and one of the really beautiful things that emerges out of these uh, collective activities is that people get to know each other through the process, but we also sort of see the failures um, and the successes of a sentence and really start to question like what is a sentence and what does a sentence do? What can it do? What can it not do? And so I think part of um, what I'm introducing uh, through some of my notes today are sort of like 
my considerations around order at the grain size of like a sentence. Um, incidentally, all of us are involved in writing in one capacity or another, which is sort of nice. Uh, I think we all think about the structure of, of sentences and paragraphs and just like are speaking every single day. So that's sort of the grain size that I want to speak about. Um, and it'll be slightly autobiographical because one of the first times that I started thinking about the idea of leaky sentences was in high school 20 years ago. Um, I've aged myself. 20 years ago in high school, uh, I was in an AP lit class and I remember getting um, an essay back and I remember my teacher telling me that uh, I write um, as if I'm going on a month trip even though it's only a week journey. And I was like, wow, okay, that's really beautiful that you decided to give this critique to me with such uh, beauty. Um, but what she was really saying is that the way that I wrote constantly was sort of like I was packing too much in or this thing was sort of leaking or sort of extending beyond the bounds that were sort of created for it. Um, and at that time, it really made me very frustrated with writing and frustrated with sort of like expressing myself because I felt that there was a particular logic um, and a logic that was imposed by like an AP exam, of course, by the curriculum that uh, she had created. Uh, but there was a sense that a sentence could only look like a sentence, and a sentence could only have these types of boundaries. And so I'm really interested in thinking about leaky sentences um, or leaky containers and thinking about sort of the history of containerization as a, sort of a movement uh, that's designed for portability. So you make things nice and tidy uh, so that you can move them around more quickly. Um, and so sort of thinking about this question of what happens when our goal isn't to move things around quickly, our goal isn't for efficiency, but our goal is to understand uh, so where sprawling and things spilling and leaking become really productive and not sort of like a hindrance to efficiency. Um, who reads Emily Dickinson? We all do, of course. <laughs> she uh, is problematic in many ways, uh, but I also <laughs> find uh, her poetry really beautiful and she actually has this letter that she wrote uh, to Higginson, who was the editor of The Atlantic at the time. Um, they were in correspondence about her writing. If you know anything about her writing, you know that it's a bit disorganized. She's constantly turning verbs into nouns, nouns into verbs. She makes her own sentences. Um, and she's part of a traditional ecosystem of lots of writers who sort of create their own logic or structure or order for their little universes of poems and work. Uh, and in this particular letter to Higginson, she writes, uh, Dear friend, are these more orderly? I thank you for the truth. I had no monarch in my life and cannot rule myself. And when I try to organize, my little force explodes and leaves me bare and charred. I think you called me wayward. Will you help me improve? Um, and I start a lot of talks with this uh, passage because in a lot of ways, this sort of epitomize how, how I think about my own practice and the sort of attempt to create order in the way that I talk about what I'm doing, to create order in the way that I present myself, create order in the way that I make sense of the world. Um, and sort of this note that she has to Higginson being an interesting moment of sort of snarkily asking for a monarch or asking for order, but also being very pleased with herself and being pleased with sort of her uh, freedom to uh, write and make sense of the world in sort of this sprawling fashion. Um, I told Chloe a couple of weeks, I don't, well time, I don't even know, mm, like at some point, week? maybe last yeah. week, thank you, uh, that we, I was, where were we together? We were somewhere together. Mm, you're okay. Yes, we we're at my opening <laughs> yeah. together, yes. And I was like, still work mode. Um, and I was like, the thing I've been thinking about is in relation to some, some things I've been thinking about. Um, and Chloe has a really beautiful Instagram feed. This is not like a plug, but like she has a beautiful Instagram feed <laughs> because a lot of it is like this very poetic writing. Um, and she posted something um, from something that she had written two years prior. Uh, and she one of the lines was, perhaps the poem is a form of bondage. And I thought that was such like a beautiful um, response to something else that she was reading. And it made me think about a sentence in a lot of ways as sort of this attempt to like hold on really words together and to create connective tissue and this sort of interest in like what happens when a sentence leaks or doesn't uh, want connective tissue, what happens when we are okay with that. But also like what is the beauty, um, as Chloe noted, in sort of a poem having the economy of language of being uh, precise and allowing the person who's reading or interacting with it to unfold it for themselves. Um, there's tons more stuff to say, but I feel like we'll do much better if we're talking to each other than for me just to talk. So I'm going to stop talking for now, uh, and then we're going to talk to each other because we like each other. <laughs> yeah. So maybe, Chloe, you should give a little context to um, perhaps the poem is a form of bondage, given that Camila's brought it up, and I kind of want to know about that, too. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm on the spot now because um, I am so sure that I did write 
this, and I'm <laughs> so, so, so sure that I, not only did I write this, I put it out in my very public Instagram feed, um, where you can learn almost nothing about my life and simultaneously feel incredibly close to me. Um, but I don't remember what I was talking about. And in terms of reflecting on this, like, Okay, so already we have the context clue that I, I posted this sometime in 2018, and yeah. it was about something that I was thinking about in 2016. Yes. And um, I have to say for all of us, the period from 2016 to now has been incredibly <laughs> significant. Um, in 2016, the thing that I was thinking about most was the relationship of abstraction to empathy, and then particularly to blackness. Uh, I was also losing my mind and having a hard time eating, and I traveled constantly. Mm. So my psychological state was poor overall. Um, and I do know that the idea of a poem leaving space for someone to unfold it and put themselves into it to insert yourself is a very important space for me. And I also know um, that the idea of bondage is a fraught one for many people, mm -hmm. but when I talk about it, I don't mean in terms of enslavement. Mm -hmm. um, I mean in terms of a relationship that can exist between two or more people mm -hmm. and mechanisms. Um, and I think what I've learned from that space is how much is required from all participants, mm -hmm. by which I mean including objects. Mm -hmm. And Aruna and I were sitting in the back together and sort of getting our thoughts. I don't even know if we were getting our thoughts together. We were getting our thoughts. And um, one of the things that keeps coming up is this idea of why we need freedom of speech mm -hmm. if we already have freedom, right? Mm -hmm. And I saw Natalie is here somewhere. Thank you, Natalie, wherever you are. <laughs> we really love you. <laughs> um, and um, coming back to sort of what you just introduced, Camila, like there is a really powerful question uh, of what counts as disintegration or what mm -hmm. counts as order. I'm actually really mad that you said that Emily Dickinson is disordered. Um, I find her to be highly, highly, highly ordered in her mm -hmm. own way. Um, yeah. And actually some of her work leaves some of the least space for me. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the way that she does it. But the other thing I can't help thinking about in terms of unfolding is that book, uh, The Gorgeous Nothings, The Beautiful Nothings, the poems that she wrote on scraps of paper and mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. envelopes, which is a practice that people in my family also have. <laughs> um, we will write on anything at any point and then just kind of leave it around and no one can ever find their notes about anything. And this idea of even the piece of paper itself as a kind of unfolding or a journey, mm -hmm. right? So what happens when objects participate? Mm -hmm. Can I respond about Emily really quickly? Yeah. Thank you so much, because I absolutely agree, because she creates her own universes that make it hard to enter. Um, one thing that I started learning about her is that when she wrote, oftentimes editors would then take what she has written and then translate it into a more orderly fashion for the reader. Yeah. And so there's this interesting element of like what her intended form was, what is the actual form that like arrives on the page, and then us sort of negotiating that. But I think you're very, very right about the orderliness of what she has written, and then trying to figure out if that's the orderliness that she wanted. But yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I'm gonna add like a just tiny historic footnote and then yeah. totally turn it over <laughs> to you. Do you guys know who her editors were? They were her sister-in-law that she was in love with for yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like not only, right, not only was she being yeah. reordered, but she was being reordered sort of out of this like lesbian love situation and into like a palatable spinster lady poet mm -hmm. situation by the very person who had caused the problem. Yeah. Amazing. And family, so complicated. Okay. This is all about <laughs> Emily Dickinson today. So I, love that you guys just um, brought up this idea of translation because when I, I and this is something that sort of follows from uh, th our previous conversations mm -hmm. because it uh, I, I love this idea of, of the leaky sentence and I love the idea for me I've I've thought about a lot this idea that um, that the mistranslation and the misunderstood mm -hmm. is is where is where meaning actually gets mm -hmm. produced right not in terms of perfect understanding but in the kind of work that we have to do to reach out outwards from ourselves outwards from our 
um, positions in order to mm -hmm. make sense of something that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. or not make sense of it, but allow our misunderstanding to exist in the world, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, and I think about this in terms of all, all sorts of things, but I think about it really in terms of our um, desire to control others, mm -hmm. right? Um, th that our insistence on understanding the other is often, as in the, it sounds like in the case of Dickinson, as a process of controlling them, right? Mm -hmm. Controlling them, controlling their desires, controlling um, their meaning, controlling their method, controlling their politics, whatever it is. So, you know, I'm, I, uh, Amara was teasing me last night because the last time that I was in this group, I more, I, I th I don't think I'm more or less said. I think I just said, fuck empathy. And one of the reasons is that empathy em empathy is, is based on the idea that one can understand the other. And I, I read that understanding as a form of, of defining and therefore in that process controlling. And so, um, so for the for for me the this idea of the leaky sentence and the idea of being able to um, kind of visualize that or or articulate that, which it sounds like you know so much of these the the workshop sort of specifically today, but so much of your work mm -hmm. is about seems to really get to that mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Mark? No, okay, I'm going to talk about vomit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's related because I think like as I was like a very like anxious little kid, so I threw up all the time. Um, yeah, it happens, <laughs> and um, you know, like if you're vomiting or about to vomit, you have like no empathy for anyone. You cannot think beyond your body. Like it is horrible, and then it's over. It's not that bad, but there's a moment that I'm mm. I'm. I'm pretty sure all of you have been in at one point or another where you know you're about to throw up and like that is the only thing in your universe. Oh. And those are the kinds of moments that I feel like particularly politics are calling for right now and yet we're trying to use empathy as a political motivator and that it just doesn't make it doesn't make physical sense to me, but it even more doesn't make any intellectual sense to me. I just want to say as as a show of solidarity that when I was a little kid, my cousins used to call me Barfaruni because I also oh, had no. the same thing. But I also but but I you know, this the other part of this that it that it leads to, right, is that I am of the strong belief that no good politics mm -hmm. comes out of someone saying, I want to do this for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That 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 the only that the only truly revolutionary politics comes out of I need to do this for me and and the me can be the collective. the us right the me can be the collective the me can be more than the narcissistic individual but that it that it comes from that mm -hmm. right as opposed to what I think is like the tendency for um, liberal politics and the liberal state mm -hmm. to pretend at least, right, or to embrace the rhetoric of um, that this is for, for other people, right? And I think that there is a kind of, um, I think, you know, as you may have noticed, I get, you know, through this whole, uh, you know, series of encounters that I've had uh, around this amazing, you know, over year long seminar is that when we start talking about things like freedom of speech, <coughs> right? Um, and, you know, Natalie's talk last night um, sort of really made that very cogent. We are already assuming the values of the liberal state. Right of of liberal democracy and you know liberal democracy and neoliberal democracy the line that separates them is pretty much non-existent except for a temporal one right I mean you know that in terms of the politics of the individual and that you know I 
you know, to say that why do you need freedom of speech if you have freedom is also to say how do you imagine how do you imagine speaking outside of the boundaries of the state of the current state at least right how do you imagine a different kind of state right so it's not even about how do you distribute power right in in the state's existing form right that's not the question the question is why the hell are we accepting the state that we're living in now right so anyway that's all i wanted to say mostly i just wanted to declare myself <laughs> um, I think this relates actually something to something Vanessa brought up about private and personal mm -hmm. as opposed to public. Um, and she said something like, uh, private space does not contain public rights. And there's something to me really related about kind of this not necessarily going outside of the state, but going further within the self Retreating. or, the, yeah. yes, and so it's not just withdrawal necessarily, but it's um, an internal exploration that maybe isn't just um, not public, but it is also not public and limited to a specific audience. Um, and I just wanted to ask you all if there are spaces in which that dis the, the register of the discussion shifts, the register of the speech shifts because of who is listening and how that operates. Especially in your writings. I mean, like Chloe, for example. Like, <laughs> when you, you know, when you're, I mean, some of the things that you post in very public ways are clearly at, come out of very intimate personal experiences, yet they're depersonalized because of actually the fact that they're appearing in social media. And they may or may not describe something that has to do with your life, and so that ambiguity gives you a place to play, right? So what does that mean to you? Why, why is that important? You know, the other thing that's come up a lot around this idea of empathy or freedom of speech or who's speaking and who's listening is how well we can pretend or presume to know each other mm -hmm. and what we have completely failed to talk about is how well we can pretend or presume to know ourselves because your knowledge of other people is very much predicated on that. And most of us, honestly, no matter how hard we try, don't know ourselves that well, right? If we did, there would be no field of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be really interesting. That's a cool what if, but like it's not the world that I actually live in. So um, coming back to this idea of my own writing, uh, the first thing I wanna say is I never told anyone I was telling the truth. Mm. You are feeling away, mm. and I am putting things there for you to feel away. Mm -hmm. It is not necessarily the way that I was feeling. I cannot presume what it will make you feel. I do presume that it will make you feel. Mm -hmm. um, that is my practice and my skill. It is what I am good at. It's highly manipulative, and it's highly crafted. Mm. That doesn't make it less true, mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's my truth, right? I'm giving people things that are sort of um, giving them back the gift of themselves when I'm doing the best that I can do. Mm. Like you're looking at me. <laughs> no, I want. I, but this is really interesting to me because it's essentially you're inviting people to bear witness to some kind of event um, that is may or may not be truthful, may or may not, but it is an expression. And you know, in some ways, Camila, in your work, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the language works mm -hmm. that you are making specific mm -hmm. declarations. Mm -hmm they're ambiguous on certain levels, mm -hmm. but definitely unambiguous on others. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that oscillation and how yeah. and how cre setting up the order that you set mm -hmm. up, you also are it simultaneously mm -hmm. internally undoing it? Yeah, I guess um, just like to even push back on that a little bit, the sense of ambiguity in non-ambiguity is not universal, right? Like someone else could, someone could approach the work and be like, this is so confusing. I have no idea what this is about. And someone else could immediately look at it and be like, I get it. Based upon where they are in the world, where they are in their lives, they, they have a certain, uh, I guess, um, subjectivity or background understanding or context for making sense of the work. And so 
I think one thing that is interesting to me about this conversation uh, and about all conversations actually is that we often use pronouns like like we and us and they and and there's a presumption uh, <laughs> of who is in, who is included in those uh, very coherent groups that we're creating and so in a lot of my work um, I had like one banner that was like are we there yet um, and everyone like answered the question like we're definitely not there yet we have so far to go and I was like dude we haven't even like established who we're talking about as the we uh, in that in that question right and so. I think about a lot of my work because I used to be a high school teacher. There's like this interesting, at least for me, uh, moment of moving back and forth to sort of push people to actually think about the logic of, or illogic of what I'm saying. Because I am curious about what orders people are willing to accept and which orders they're willing to like push against. So if I create an entire body of work that uses like mathematics as a conceit, are you just willing to accept that? Um, the logic of what I create, or are you willing to engage in a conversation with me about that? Um, which is why this year in particular, 2019, so you're in, 2019, I've made it um, more of a non-negotiable part of my practice that any work that I put out into the world has to come along with public programming. Uh, and that has a lot to do with my uh, very, very assertive stance that artwork itself does nothing, like art does nothing, um, unless there is a space for people to engage collectively around that work. Like a piece, anything that I create in the world, I, I, I actually become frustrated when people are like, your work creates social justice. And I was like, that's just like a weird sentence to begin with <laughs> uh, and makes no sense. Um, or like your work is like creating equity. I'm like, no, it's not. Like it's an object that lives in the world. It may spark a conversation that someone may have with another person. Um, but I guess that in like for me and thinking about my practice, it's important to think about the object that's created as a starting place for a conversation that's had in structured collective environments because the goal of my work is not to like make a statement ever. The goal of my work is to see what people are willing to push back on in conversation with one another. Um, so I think the ambiguity works in that if I close everything off and say that this is declaratively what I believe, there's no space for someone else to enter. Um, and I want people to be able to enter, and if they want to exit, they should be able to exit. Uh, but I want people to enter and then be able to find a space, like some aftercare for that experience to actually engage with folks around those things. And like we enter into fictions all the time. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is a fiction. Democracy is a fiction, right? Healthcare is kind of a terrible, really mean fiction. Um, <laughs> and so to say that we have to have like a, a flat point of view in order for somebody to be able to participate in something is just fundamentally false. Um, I think emotional truth is like a backwards truth in terms of time. I don't mean that in terms of understanding, but like a, a feeling becomes true once you feel it. It's not true before that. I don't know what happens after, but it doesn't become true until you feel it. Hmm. And so I think also that's where this idea of kind of leaving space for publics mm -hmm. and for public engagement um, kind of amplifies that for a group. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not even making space for publics. It's actually creating publics, right? I mean, that's hmm. I mean that's part of I think how your work functions so. Hmm. Um, powerfully is that you're actually, you know, we, we sort of talk about these things like that the public exists, right, out there. Mm -hmm. The public is just there. But but whether it's social justice work or art making mm -hmm, or a mm -hmm. combination of the two, right, or whatever other interventions in the world, mm -hmm. we're constantly creating publics, mm -hmm. right? And we're constant, and in that creation, you know, we, we are creating them in both positive and negative senses, right? We are, we're creating um, a, a public that may not have existed before, but we're also at times, not through Camila's work, but like, you know, in other senses, museums say they're always creating a public that includes and excludes, right? Or um, presumes and, and, you know, presumes a certain participation and then, uh, ignores a kind of other sort of participation, right? Like, so we're always creating publics, and I feel like one of the powerful things that you do in your work is that you're always asking, what is the public that is, that is, that can form, right, mm -hmm. around this? What is the public that, um, that may not have, exi not, that may not have seen itself as a public, right? Mm -hmm. um, individuals who may not have seen themselves as a public, and and now they are, right? Even momentarily. And I think that those um, <coughs> interventions, in a sense, 
that, you know, these are the types of things that make speech possible, right? They're the kinds of things that, you know, that make free speech possible, right? Like we, you know, free, those, these platforms for speech don't exist out of thin air, right? They're created constantly. And so the idea of creating different kinds of spa possibilities for that seems to me like, you know, the, the, I think, for me at least, one of the most important, one of the reasons that I pay attention to art is because there are constantly, you know, different efforts, different kinds of efforts made to create those possibilities and those platforms. And sometimes those are in spite of the structures within they, oh, yeah. within, you know, which they exist. And, you know, I think, um, you know, one of the things that um, we talked a little bit about was uh, the space of misunderstanding the last time we kind of got together. And I think um, the openness to allow for that is part of the freedom and flexibility of that finding of meaning in a space where you may or may not have a real relationship to the thing that's being presented. Um, and so, I don't know, I thought it would be useful at this point to, to talk a little bit, Aruna, maybe about um, the piece of writing that you did about not understanding. Um, um, because I, 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 I think the, um, the idea of misunderstanding or being excluded, be, being excluded from understanding because of a, a differential in language or other barriers becomes a space where we might be able to see our way through to other freedoms of expression that don't entail speech or some other mode of communication that seems to forever be failing us. Um, so this this was something for anyone who was at our last conversation. It will sound familiar, but this was a piece of writing. It was a it was just a, a an observation, really, um, about uh, one of my favorite novels, which is not a terribly highbrow novel, um, but it sparked so much productive thinking for me that I really do love it. Um, and that is Amitav Ghosh's Sea of Poppies. And in Gosha's Sea of Poppies, it's a it's the sprawling narrative that takes um, you know the, it, uh, that takes place on a on a ship and also in various other sites in India, um, and uh, the uh, it follows the the opium trade, but it follows it in its broadest form from uh, the Americas to England around the coast of uh, you know, the African continent, uh, through the Indian Ocean, uh, up till Calcutta. And uh, its characters, and it's set in the late 18th century, and the characters in this novel, none of them speak the same language. And when I say they don't speak the same language, what I mean is on the ship itself, there's a kind of pirates, pigeon language that develops, that combines Hindi and English and various African uh, dialects and uh, various um, Asian dialects, uh, because these crews are being picked up all along the route and have created this mishmash of language in order to help them pro literally propel the ship forward, right? But then there's also the people from the, the indentured servants, from the from indentured laborers, from the poppy fields. There are also the Maharajas. There are also the, um, you know, uh, British colonialists who are running the poppy trade. And none of them speak a language, except for, the, actually, except for the Maharaja, none of them speak a language that the reader would easily understand. The The most hilarious part is that the British colonialists, the, the colonizers, um, or the British East India Company people, speak a form of English that might as well be 
Arabic. Like it might as well be. It's it's so because he, the the author is himself. Uh, uh, some, he's an anthropologist and really he's a linguist, right? And so you've got this very precise thing where he's he, all of the characters are speaking uh, in languages that they don't fully understand, although there's many overlaps, right, in terms of vocabulary and words. But the most interesting thing is he doesn't translate any of the dialects for you, any of the dialects that the characters are speaking. So as a reader, you are dealing with the same level of incomprehension as the characters are experiencing when they are listening to each other, right? And you know, sometimes the incomprehension ends up with these very comical kinds of encounters, but ultimately, the narrative is still pushed forward, right? And in order to read this novel, you kind of have to let yourself sink into incomprehension. You have to kind of, you have to let yourself kind of in, you know float on the words, right? The way that the ship floats on the ocean, you float on the language, and ultimately you understand it. Ultimately, this this mishmash of misunderstanding leads to a kind of revolutionary moment at the end of the novel, right? And a revolutionary moment that makes possible the next part, the next in the series. And so to me, this idea of, of incomprehension as the kind of, as, as, as creating a kind of space, right, where people are able to insert their own desires, right, to insert their own, uh, you know, urgencies, right, and and kind of move forward together. To me, that was a beautiful metaphor for how we could think of our our political moment, where on the one hand, you know, none of us can exist in perfect solidarity with each other, but there is still ways, I think, still opportunities for sort of imagining coalitions, not based on full understanding, but based on uh, just that desire for for moving for movement for 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 movement in a direction that's different from where we're coming from and maybe that's a little bit about camilla's containerization or the desire for that kind of overflow to have that be okay mm -hmm. um because maybe that um to come back to emily dickinson you know mm -hmm. kind of um allows one to kind of be in a space of okayness mm -hmm. Let's just say. Um, and it's sort of, I don't know, I was thinking as you were talking about the leaky containers and that like leakage, the, the leakage in this case is understanding yeah. that the leakage isn't the problematic part. Mm -hmm. The leakage is what you kind of get. And, you know, last night, and I felt this way actually throughout the seminar series where, you know, there are moments where everything comes into really stark clarity and then I kind of lose it and it goes into back into the muddle and then comes back out again. And I think that that's kind of what learning is mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, but Camila, talk about the part of the leak that mm -hmm. you're interested in because I think that's significant. Yeah, so what's funny about I was I was like just Googling leakage and all the connotations around that are negative right like you need to stop up a leak you need to fix a leak it's never uh, seen as like a leaky sink is a really great thing because who <laughs> loves like it's it's almost never positive and so i guess there's an element of me uh being interested in like the moment of like defining that a moment is a moment of leakage because then there's also this question around who's defining the container from which the thing is leaking right oh, and where it's leaking to exactly so there's there's all these directional questions right of like the thing is moving from one place to another place and and in, in, in that process of moving to another place like what what is the concern and so i i, I keep coming back to this question around why, why we're so afraid of that moment of leakage and so i think for me what i'm most interested in is like that moment where you like create the like hole uh, and the thing comes out and like that moment where it comes out and like where does where does it go now because the idea that once something is leaking it's leaking onto a floor is leaking is leaking into a lot of places and then the next impulse would be to gather it up and then to containerize it again so there's this question of like when the thing leaks or when the sentence leaks or when the moment leaks or when the identity leaks then what what is the next attempt um or or ploy for for which we're trying to contain this um, and, I, and I said I was gonna say something autobiographical and then I forgot to. 
Um, <laughs> so I'll say it now. One of the things that was interesting to me, because I was like sitting one day, I was in Chicago just a few days ago, and like thinking about my life because I, because uh, why not? Um, and I spent all this time at the expo, like talking about work, and I finally had like a moment to, like, think about myself and. And I was like, oh, like I had like a very leaky upbringing in the sense that like my parents converted to Islam in the 80s um, and then they raised us as Muslim. But then I was sent to Catholic school and then went to Mormon school dances because they were gender segregated. My parents were like super geeked about that. <laughs> um, and then when I moved to um, moved to Brooklyn, I uh, moved to a part of Brooklyn that has a large uh, Orthodox Jewish community. And so like my life often sort of like leaked in these really interesting ways that felt very fulfilling for me because it allowed for me to occupy and be in different spaces um, in a lot of ways. And I was sort of thinking to myself of like, what if my parents had not converted to Islam at this time and then not had like brought leakage of like what they were brought up with into that context? What if my grandfather had not celebrated Christmas with us on December 26th instead of December 25th? Um, what if I had not gone to Catholic school? So all these sort of what if questions um, around sort of, I guess what may have been an intentional or unintentional part of my parents' upbringing to allow me to sort of sprawl or to allow like my sense of like spiritual identity to leak um, or diffuse in ways that feel very productive um, for me. And so I hadn't thought about that until recently, but um, got very excited about that in the context of like uh, my own spiritual journey, but also in thinking about the idea of even like an academic discipline and what it means for an academic discipline to leak or sprawl um, and just all these other generative opportunities where things begin to overlap and can, um, yeah, flow out in ways that we aren't comfortable with as yet. I just wanted to jump in yeah. with your with your observation about no one understanding, you know, a leaky sink can be yeah. a positive thing or whatever. But I was thinking that in a way, the kind of the kind of foundational kind of anxiety around leakage is the leakage from certain kinds of bodies, bodies yep. that have period, bodies yep. that breastfeed bodies that right like you know that 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 there is a kind of fundamental fear mm -hmm. of leakage that mm -hmm. is that seems to me as you mm -hmm. know old school feminist that is a fundamental fear of that that the bodies that are that, that are that function in certain ways right and yeah. you know and so um yeah i was just thinking like what whatever leaked that I enjoyed and I thought well when I had my baby mm. and I was worried that I wasn't producing m enough milk for yeah, her I yeah. was so happy when my breasts leaked right yeah. no one else was every you know <laughs> like people were horrified but I was thrilled yeah. right and 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 I was thinking you know that there are these you know when I didn't want to be pregnant I was thrilled that my you mm. know that my period came and I was leaking mm -hmm. right like I mean but but these are very right there's there's something as well that's yeah. very deeply psychic about yeah. this sort of um need to contain the leak right and leaking across I, I think uh to this note around particular bodies uh bodies that leak over borders or bodies that yeah. leak over absolutely lines that we've drawn um and i think this is like particularly interesting to me because a lot of the language around um our current crisis around immigration is all about this fear of like bodies flowing in from another mm -hmm. place to this place, bodies leaking into this particular moment, or the desire to like not have certain bodies leak into certain neighborhoods because yeah. we don't want those bodies there, or this desire to contain certain bodies through incarceration. We don't want them to leak out into the general public yeah. because they should not be part of the public in that way. And so there's this conversation around architecture and leakage and ideas of containment, which are both like physical in the sense that there's like a physical wall or barrier that prevents this movement, but also the sense of like not being able to get our minds past a certain part of a thinking process to allow for that leakage to occur for us to like figure out that moment where that leakage and thought might be generative too. Mm -hmm. So we have like three really, really, really interesting metaphors going simultaneously. <laughs> Synthesize. I can't. I'm going to try. I can't. It's going to be leaky. We have the body, we have the boat, and we have the idea of borders. We have the nation state, yeah. right? Um, I like the body, the boat, and the borders. It sounds better, but actually we're talking about the body, the boat, and the nation state. Um, and in all of these conditions, the idea of sort of what is being leaked and to where mm -hmm. is different, and something different happens in all of those contexts, right? If the boat is leaky, it sinks. So that's bad, probably. 
<laughs> if the body is leaky, it could be good, could be bad, or you get uncomfortable with it. I already talked about barf once. That's sufficient. <laughs> That's a great leak. <laughs> it's a great. If the nation state leaks, it probably eventually becomes something that is not the nation state, mm -hmm. which I think personally mm -hmm. could be really good. But I see why at a time when so much work across the board in terms of what we think of as work mm -hmm. is being invested just to maintain things, mm -hmm. um, that that would be a very risky kind of leak to enter into, mm -hmm. to say, we will allow this to happen, and that means that the thing itself that we are allowing to leak will end. And perhaps we've already proven that it's over. It's just that the nation state has to catch up to that. Yeah, that, uh, to that point, it's like yeah. the, the leak when we recognize it is not the leak when someone else recognizes it, right? That's so right. So like all of these conversations, even around immigration, are like prohibiting these moments of illegal leakage. But I'm like, well, it's happening. Yeah. So There's like no your concern about that moment of leak is almost delayed uh, in a certain way. Not only delayed, but it is um, perceived as not happening because it is against the desires of the exactly. powerful. Because I didn't see it, it didn't happen. Yes. So I hate to close this because I feel like we're kind of on a roll, but as it is, we, um, we're already a little bit post our moment. And we have an amazing um, performance coming up. Um, uh, by Mendy and Keith Obadike, um, and it's called In the Mouth of This Dragon. So, over time. Ooh.